for a presentation by, again, our esteemed Dr. Asa Gordon. The topic tonight will be a new birth of freedom, redeeming the Declaration. Resolve the compact that exists between the North and the South is a covenant with death and agreement with hell. It should be immediately enough. That resolution was passed by the famed abolitionist William Law Garrison. The compact that he was referring to was the Constitution of the United States. And the reason why he referred to it as a compact with the devil and agreement with hell is because in its original form, compromises were made to sanction and protect slavery in perpetuity. In reaction to this, the Republican Party platforms in 1856 and 1860 identified the Declaration of Independence as the true Constitution of the United States. Resolved that the maintenance and the principles promulgated in the Declaration of Independence and embodied in the Federal Constitution are essential to the preservation of our Republican institutions. The Reconstruction Era Constitutional Framers of 1868 and acting amendments to, the, to reconstitute the Constitution of 1787 with the original declaration intent that all men are created equal of the founding fathers of the American Revolution. At the end of the Civil War, the debate of Reconstruction was a debate to own the, the Declaration. You will find the reference that Declaration always meant all men are created equal and endowed by a certain inalienable rights. So the debate from 1860 to 1870, I want you to think about this. From 1860 to 1870, three amendments to the Constitution of Paris, five years. 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. Those amendments mirror the ideal of the French Revolution. The 13th Amendment, liberty. 14th Amendment, equality. 15th Amendment, the franchise, the right of fraternity. And so they refer, since the original Constitution of 1787 had compromised on the issue of slavery, now, the abolitionists in the debate during the construction said the original constitution, the organic constitution, is our declaration. And anything that is inconsistent with our organic constitution, the declaration, is not involved. And so, the issue became an issue of people who 
bring and the doctrine is declaration. For if the language, for if the language as understood at that day would embrace them, the conduct of the distinguished men who framed the Declaration of Independence would have been unutterably and frankly inconsistent with the principles they assert, and indeed of the sympathy of mankind to which they so confidently appealed. They would have deserved and received universal rebuke and reprobation. So if that was in the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court, and Essence said the Declaration of Independence at the time of the original Constitution, and I understand when you talk about originalism, this is what originalism means. Originalism is how the Declaration is interpreted in the Dred Scott decision, that it only applied to Caucasians. It did not apply. Because they would be hypocrites, because many of them owned slaves at the time. Next slide. We turn it again. Next slide. And so at that time, Abraham Lincoln, back. <laughs> at that time, Abraham Lincoln. Next slide. Next slide. Abraham Lincoln interpreted the Declaration as a normative standard and aspiration that should guide the regime and that should be approximated as much as possible under the circumstances, even if it could not be fully realized in practice. Making first official reply to the Dred Scott decision on June 26, 1857, was clearly intended as a rebuttal to Taney's view of the Declaration. Quote, the founders did not mean to assert the obvious untruth that all men were actually enjoying equality, not yet that they were about to confer it immediately upon them. In fact, they had no power to confer such a boon. They meant simply to confer the right so that the enforcement of it might follow as fast as circumstances should permit. They meant to set up a standard maximum for free society, which should be familiar to all, and very by all, constantly looked to, constantly labored for, and even though never perfectly attained, constantly approximated, and thereby constantly spreading and depending and deepening its influence and augmenting the happenstance and a rule of all life to all people of all colors everywhere. And so Dr. Abraham Lincoln said, no, realistically we know that they never, but it is that declaration was an aspiration that we all were striving to attain. Next slide. The Constitution Compromise of 1787. Now, this particular aspect of this uh, talk is predicated on a new exhibit that's going to be at the African American Civil War Museum, entitled, uh, that is going to call, entitled, Bullets to Balance, the Voting Rights Legacy of the United States Country. And what it's going to focus on, the struggle of those soldiers of African descent to try to attain equal rights by virtue of leveraging their service to help save the union. All right, resolve. The compact that exists between the North and the South is a covenant with definite agreement held involving both parties in the choice of campaign. As I said, that was drafted by William Mark Madison. The original Constitution frame is compromised to create affirmative action racial quota articles to institutionalize disproportionate political power to a minority interest to protect slavery and establish a racial hierarchy to preserve white privilege. Now, I want you to understand that the original, that the original system of codes, of perfect action codes to protect a minority to have disproportionate representation in our system 
was by the constitutional framers of the Constitution. And so the original constitutional framers created affirmative action articles in order to give disproportionate representation to slave owners, to frustrate a majority. Next slide, please. Here are the Constitution the affirmative action quota articles for white supremacy. Now, I want to tell you, everything that I'm going to tell you, uh, this is coming from the notes of the convention by uh, James Madison. James Madison, sometimes you'll pretend it's come up, the father of the Constitution. So don't blame me, <laughs> James Madison. I'm plagiarizing everything I tell you from James Madison. I'm not, I, I apologize that I'm not giving you anything new. I apologize that all I'm doing up here is plagiarizing the proper Constitution. And so when I say that the Constitution created affirmative action codes for, for white supremacy, all right, then I am I want to give you quotes from how it was viewed from the father of the Constitution. Now, this is from uh, uh, James Madison was the only delegate to the Constitution that was allowed to take notes. <laughs> he sat right next to uh, George Washington, who presided over the Constitution Convention, facing the convention. And after the, uh, he uh, would publish notes on the debates of the federal constitution by James Madison. So this is what James Madison recorded on June the 3rd, 1787. The states were divided into different interests, not by their difference of race, by other circumstances. The most material of which resulted partly from climate, but principally from the effects of their having or not having slaves. These two clauses concur in forming the great division of interest in the United States. It did not lie between the large and small states. It lay between the northern and southern. Now, how many of you have been taught that the great division of the Constitution convention was between small states and large states. That ain't what Frederick James Madison said. He said what? Between the states' own slaves and those that did not. All right, he said on July the 14th, in case you missed it, he said it seemed now to be pretty well understood that the real difference of interest lay not between the large and the small, but between the northern and southern states. The institution of slavery and its consequences form the line of discrimination. So if you went to the original father of the Constitution, he labels that the real split at the Constitution is over the issue of slavery, not small and large states. Yet if you turn on PBS, yet if you turn on the days today, they will constantly be talking about what? Large states and small states. All right, now, out of that, the first problem that came up was how would we be represented? And this is how they came up. Now, what happened? Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3. The first article set down the first racial quotas in the Constitution. Representatives and taxes shall be apportioned among the several states that may be included in this union according to their representative numbers, counting the whole number of free persons, i.e., those of European descent, including those uh, excluding, including those bound to service for its term, that is, indentured service of European descent, excluding Indians not taxed 
that is Native Americans. Three fifths of our laws, that is those of African descent. Those are quotas. The quotas in the Constitution came whole, infractions in that law set, whole if you're white, partial if you're black, zip if you're Native American. When you read Article 1, Section 2, that our racial code, yet to this day is supposed to be about why do you have quotas? Because the founding fathers set up quotas, racial quotas. When they were to give disadvantage, why are they doing this? Three fifths of all others. That is to give disproportionate representation to southern plantation owners in Congress. So the Constitution, as defined by James Madison, tells you that the Constitution was set up to give affirmative action quota articles to give disproportionate representation to whites who were interested in maintaining slavery in the House of Representatives. Now came the next thing. He said, okay, well, the southern states were satisfied by being able to count their slaves, even though they could not vote. You know, for a while in the debate, then they said, well, if you can count your slaves, but well, notice that we ought to be able to count our horses and our mules in order to have extra representation. Of course, that argument didn't prevail. So the House of Representatives, as designed by the original founding fathers of the Constitution, was designed to give disproportionate representation to the slave power. Disproportionate representation to whites who had an interest in maintaining an advantage and representation to preserve white supremacy. Now, let's satisfy the South as far as the compromise in the House. Now, I say, well, let's move to the Chief Executive. And they say, well, let's do it by popular vote. He said, wait a minute, no. Why? Because most of the whites who could vote were in the northern states. Indeed, most of the whites, the whites in the southern states, in some of the states were outnumbered by the number of slaves. So they couldn't have a popular vote, so they had to come up with a scene where they would support how we elect a chief executive that would, uh, so that the southern states would not vote from the Constitution of As a matter of fact, Governor Miles Morris, he was the one who recommended that it, it should be by popular vote. We, we all four came. I mean, obviously, we don't, we're not going for, we're going for a democracy. And here's what Governor Miles proposed. It is necessary to take into one view all that relates to the establishment of the executive. One great object of the executive is to control the legislature. The legislature will continuously seek to aggravate, aggravize, and perpetuate themselves. It is necessary, again, that the executive magistrate should be the guardian of the people, the guardian of the people, even of the law classes against legislative tyranny, against the great and wealthy, who in the course of things will necessarily compromise the legislative body. Hmm. Wealth tends to corrupt the mind and to nourish its love of power and to stimulate it to oppression. History proves this to be the spirit of the Ottoman. And who can judge so well of the discharge of military duties for the protection of the spirit of the people as the people themselves are who are to be protected and secure. Here's what James Madison said with the problem. He recalls this on July 19, 1787. There was one difficulty, however, of a serious nature attending the immediate choice by the people. What was that problem? The right of suffrage was much more diffusive, diffusive in the northern than in the southern states. What he is saying that at that time, there actually were some states that allowed free blacks to vote. In New Jersey, even some women could vote at this time. And so 
men are for the imaginary beings called states. But he was involved in the two compromises, the Freedom's Clause and the Compromise of the Electoral College. Next slide, please. So let's review. The Constitution White Affirmative but white men are the privileged voters of 1787. Established affirmative action articles for white supremacy. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 established an anti majoritarian capitalist for congressional representation. The free fifth clause that favored the minority of white slavery and holding the population of the South by counting the slave population. This disproportionate racial quota was entrenched into the fabric of the original Constitution of 1787. The second major was the Electoral College, Article 2, Section 1. This clause provided for the indirect election of the president through an Electoral College based on congressional representation. This provision incorporated the Free Fifth Clause into the Electoral College and gave whites in slave states a disproportionate influence in the election of the president. The Electoral College was designed to give white minorities disproportionate power in the election of the president, and it still works to do, they do that purpose. As it was designed by the founding fathers. And I'm saying we're still plagiarizing James Bath. Now, let's stop. Now, following the free field clause, <laughs> I must admit, I just decided to go into this because of uh, what recently occurred. You remember we had a whole debate on the census and whether we should have a citizenship clause. Now, I want to tell you, I, I, I want you to understand, history ain't history, history is not. Thank <laughs> you. 
this is late. Why do you have to come to the Jefferson School and hear this on this time for the first time? I don't know. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now we come to it. How do we make this? Evolve from the divine edition and the declaration of independence. We wholly choose to be self evident. And we hold all people to be created equal. From the divine edition of 1776 to the fraction division of 1787, just over a decade, it required a cognitive dissonance that could complementarize democracy with racial exclusion. After the Civil War, the battle began. The first issue was going to be over what? Representation. Here was the problem. Residents of France were reconstruction. Andrew Johnson, Abraham Lincoln has been assassinated. When he took over, the president of France were reconstruction. He supported the abolishment of slavery. But he did not support black suffrage. He claimed this was an issue of states' rights. Thaddeus Stevens, the leader of the House in the House of Representatives, had this only called Congressional Pass of Reconstruction. And he declared Congress alone can do it. Congress must create states and declare whether they ought to be represented. Radical Republicans supported plans to secure the franchise and protect the civil rights of black freedom. After the dissent, advocacy fought, and the granting of suffrage to the former enslaved was necessary to reconstruct the nation based on a reformed constitution as affected by the 14th and 15th amendments over contemporary objections of originalism, states' rights, and reverse discrimination. Those are spacious reconstruction era arguments that still resonate to foster racial equality. Just as the union could not be saved by proclaiming this is a white man's law, without calling on the soldiers of African descent, the post-Civil War political platform, this is a white man's government, could not be defeated. The union restored, the Constitution amended, citizenship and civil and political rights of the enslaved recognized without the vote of freedom, and the disfranchisement and ex-rebels as a legacy of the Civil War service of the United States Colored Troops. Next slide. Just before the election of the Civil War, a judge in Ohio declared the Ohio law, black law, unconstitutional. And this is from Ohio carried by Negro votes. This is in the election of Lincoln. Say that Philadelphia said that the returns of Ohio election disclosed the fact that the Republican majority has 8,000 uh, 794. 14,000 Negroes were allowed to vote under the decision of Judge Brackenall. Leaving out the Negro vote, the Democrats had a majority of 6,000. Thus, the starting, the humiliating fact appears that Ohio, a sovereign state of the Union, is under Negro rule. To such a disgrace would the Black Republican Party reduce the whole country. And then on November the 9th, after the election, the president's election throughout the union is over. And the people have learned by means of the telegram that the black Republican ticket, now, there were no black on the ticket, where it means that any party that would consider that black should be allowed to vote for all the purposes of black ticket. Of them knowing him, from the beginning to the end, this has been a sectional contest. The entire North, something perhaps the states of New Jersey and Delaware, has gone for the black Republican candidates. That would be Republican candidates. There are no black, <laughs> black candidates. But that's how the tick was left for even thinking about black suffrage. While the entire South 
has gone on for against that ticket. We shall now end upon an argument to show that should or what will be the measure the people of the South will adopt to preserve their rights in the Union of the secure Southern independence out of the Union. Now, I want you to look closely at what these two articles are saying. This article, in essence, is saying that we have to secede from the Union if there ever is a vote for its, uh, our president in which the black vote frustrates the will of the white majority. <laughs> that is what the Richmond Times are. If the black vote choice combined with a white minority frustrates the will of the white majority, the people of the South will adopt to preserve their rights in the Union a secure Southern independence out of the Union. So one of the reasons we had a civil war was the fear of the black vote frustrating the bargain will of the white vote. And they actually argued that they thought there was debate at the time that Lincoln won because blacks were allowed to vote in some of these states. Next slide. During the Civil War in 1864, when Lincoln was not sure that he was going to win the election, I found this uh, letter that's going to be part of this letter that he wrote uh, Louisiana had been liberated during this time. And they were experimenting with what reconstruction may be once the war was over. And so Lincoln writes a letter to the governor of Louisiana, which has now been you know, occupied by the Union troops, that they're about to have an election. And, it's, and in this, he uh, prophesizes what may be needed in the future to reconstruct the nation. See, dear, uh, my dear sir, I congratulate you on having fixed your name in history as the first free state governor of Louisiana. Now you are about to have a convention which, among other things, will probably define the effective franchise. I barely suggest for your private consideration whether some of the colored people may be let in. As for instance, the very intelligent, and especially those who have fought gallantly in our rights, I love the sentence, they would probably help in some trying time to come to keep the jewel of liberty within the family of freedom. But this is only a suggestion, not for the public, but to you alone. <laughs> See, Lincoln wasn't ready to let the public know at that time that he was advocating black suffrage. And so he said to keep this letter private. But what is interesting there, Lincoln, he said it will probably be in some future time it will become. Their vote will be needed to keep the jewel of liberty within the family of freedom. Now because I go and I may not have enough time to finish, I'm going to have to jump on to give you the <laughs> In right now. He was right. Well, I, I want you to understand, and the rest of this talk is going to be to give you the primary document to support this. The black vote would be necessary to amend the Constitution. You would have no 14th and 15th Amendment without the vote of ex slaves before there was a 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Now that, that sounds kind of, how can that be? Darrell, you enjoy the, con the Constitution that you take pride of today, the miracle that you define as a democracy today, is an America that is predicated on granting the vote of ex-slaves. Because a majority of the whites rejected the 14th and 15th Amendment. So the United States of America is an American made by virtue of the vote of ex-slavery. Now how did 
Roger said, you know, the documentation, that's supposed to happen. That's not the business. Next slide, please. You can follow, I mean, he has very good to the declaration. If really, there was a debate on how, uh, how are we going to amend the original flaw, the original sin in the Constitution Convention of 1787. Now, let's make clear. The 1787 Convention did not work. Let's get over it. It failed. The, army, the, the proof of this failing is the greatest civil war and the greatest number of people who died in the civil war in history. Over that document. It had, it took 600,000 Americans to correct the error of the original Constitution. All right, so he said the Union Platform and these Negro politics, this is from August the 1st, 1865. Lincoln has been assassinated now, and they're beginning the process of reconstruction. In a recent article on this subject, this is from the Dayton Empire of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, we inquired of the monarch for what particular object of the convention of this model had in view when he proposed hereafter to keep Early in view, the principles of the Declaration, if they did not mean to make a practical application of the, quote, freedom and equality proposition by extending the right of suffrage and its consequent privileges to the black race, it answers precisely the, the object which our revolutionary fathers had in view. The right of citizens of the United States to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What some Northern members insisted on was in the following, adopted at that great uh, grant, that's the Ulysses grant, reception meeting in New York on the seventh instant. Bizarre. And this uh, title is embodied in this very resolution that was made by the Republican Party form at that time. Resolved that we hold this truth to be self-evident that to him with whom we can entrust the bullet to save the life of the nation, we can entrust the battle to preserve it. And we invoke the cooperation of the federal and state government throughout the union to use all lawful means to establish a system of suffrage which shall be equal and just to all loyal men, black as well as white. And so the government was laid down, the Declaration, we declare the principles of the founding Declaration as the foundation for Reconstruction. And it has to be based on all men are created equal. Now, the problem was, next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Got it. Okay. Now, the thing in the back, I want to say, this is the southern response to that. What the people want. Say, the New York General Congress, the people want peace, fraternal relations. Reciprocal commercial income, reduction of public expenditures, and restoration of civil power in national and state governments. The Negro suffrage question, which is prominent radicals are agitating and who actions uh, ride to office and power, were highly proved to be sufficient probably for their purposes. The people will not soon begin to think more of their taxes than of the Negro. Let me repeat that. The people will soon begin to pay more of their taxes than of the Negro and will look with little interest on this philanthropic extraction. Politicians can no longer delude the people by their frantic appeals on behalf of the Negro. Enough has been done for them. It is time to do something for the oppressed and suffering whites. So already at that time, this is the the thirteenth will never pass it even been passed the of slavery. And the whites at that time have always said, already be mourning that enough has been done for the Negro. It's time to do something for the oppressed and suffering. 
own words. Next one. Garrison said, my vocation as an abolitionist, thank God, is over. Declared William Lord Garrison urging the American anti slavery society and its May 1865 amendment to dissolve and triumph. To which Frederick Douglass cried, slavery is not abolished until the black man has it now. After a ill tempered debate, Garrison's proposal was defeated. When the other fellows replaced him at the side of the president, and the national anti-slavery appeared with a new motto on his man said, quote, no reconstruction without Negro suffrage. Moving beyond the abolitionist traditional critique of slavery as essentially a moral condition, Phillips turned his attention to the balance of highest power, class power in the reconstructed South. And lest the freemen are uh, granted the vote, the planet's hegemony would be restored and the promise of emancipation undermined. I do not believe, he wrote, <laughs> in an English freedom that trusts the welfare of the dependent class to the goodwill and moral sense of the other class. I think that's something we should take hard and think about in the coming election. Next slide, please. Abraham Lincoln wrote in his last address, it is unsatisfactory to some, he, he remarked, that the elected franchise is not given to the colored race. I would myself refer that it is now conferred on the very intelligent and on those who serve as soldiers. Just as Lincoln evolved during the Civil War to realize that the Union could not be saved without reaching out to soldiers of African descent, Lincoln evolved to realize that the Union could not be restored without extending the franchise to blacks. And Lincoln became a model, the only presidential model to black voting rights. Next slide. Here are some of the uh, bullets from his last public address. He said, embarrassed that we, the Lordy people, different among themselves as the man and means of reconstruction. What he's talking there is about his white colleagues. They were confused at what should be the man's of destruction. But he knew of a group that was not confused, and that were those of African descent. And he argued for the reorganization of the national thought of reconstruction. And he pointed to Louisiana. You remember during the Civil War, he had written a letter to the governor of Louisiana before the Civil War is over, advocating in private that he consider extending the franchise. And he said, the year of the state of Louisiana have shown allegiance to the union, assumed to be the rightful political power of the state. They have held elections, organized the state government, adopted a free state constitution, given the benefit of public schools, equally to black and white, which is April 11, 1865, and empowered the legislation to refer the effective franchise upon the colored man. What has been said of Louisiana will apply generally to all other states. In attendance to that address was John Wilkes Booth, who had a plan to kidnap Lincoln. But when he heard her Lincoln talk about a stand in the franchise like he turned that Confederate fight and white supremacy upon hearing niggas and dogs voting rights for blacks, Booth became enraged and he declared, quote, that means nigger citizenship. I'll put him through. That's the last thing she would ever make. Booth changed the plans from kidnapping the President Nation to assassination. Next slide. Presidential reconstruction. The president, after Lincoln uh, uh, died, Andrew Johnson, my, my wife is telling me now I need to, <laughs> I'm running out of time, so I'm speeding up here. So let's say Andrew Johnson, he commences the State of the Union address the screening arguments of originalism. I want you to understand that the arguments you hear today, that you think are modern arguments against the current fashion, originalism, Reverse discrimination and states' rights. 
Those arguments were made against the first civil rights bill that was passed in 1866. The very first bill that was passed in civil rights, the argument against it was made by the president, and the argument was this discriminate against white in behalf of black. And that argument, that bill was passed by that Congress over his veto. Yes, I agree. Please, what this president did, he actually issued proclamations. He issued proclamations to, in essence, to grant to all of the former Confederates the right to franchise and decide to repeal their constitution. And, uh, and every one of those former Confederates, they actually drew up a constitution that did not allow any of the former slaves to vote. Next slide. At that time, Harvard Speaker was pointing out that he is uh, former Confederates that were pleading for a pardon. And he was comparing that, and this says pardon or franchise. And here is this, this representative, <laughs> Columbia, the one for uh, liberty and freedom, and he said, are the franchise. And he said, advocating for voting rights for black men. Nash used this cartoon to contrast former Confederates, such as the Vice President Sam Stevens, Congressman Robert Jones, Admiral Rico Sims, and General Robert Lee, and Bell Hood, begging for bodies with a black Union veteran who had lost his leg in service to this country. Although Nash believed manhood suffered was a natural birthright, he knew his natural audience required additional justification of national service and personal sacrifice. Next five minutes. Now, the reason why you have a constitution today, here's what is critical, and this is why many Southerners today do not believe and do not support the 14th Amendment. And they elect judges that do not believe in the 14th, 15th Amendment. The reason for that is that all of the Southern when Congress convened to representatives from the states from the former Confederates who made up their legislation to be re-admitted. They, it, it, the representatives said, include the former Confederate Vice President, <laughs> six members of the Confederate Cabinet, four Confederate generals, and 58 former Confederate congressmen. Outraged and appalled, Congress refused to seat the Southern representatives from the white-only conventions and ends presidential reconstruction and begins congressional reconstruction. This is a cartoon to say, as Congress prepared to convene on December 4, 1865, the clerk of the House announced that he would not recognize any of the elected representatives from the Confederate States. To make it short, what I'm trying to tell you is that when the Confederates reorganized under presidential reconstruction, Congress refused to recognize any of those representatives. They then put them on the Marsh Law and say you will not have a valid convention until you allow slaves to vote in those conventions. There is no 15th Amendment. So they realized the only way they could amend the Constitution was to disfranchise all of the former Confederates and enfranchise those who form the slave. You have a 14th and 15th Amendment to the Constitution by disfranchising the majority of the whites from the South and enfranchising the majority of their slaves. If you had allowed the whites to vote in that convention, you would have no 14th and 15th Amendment to the Constitution. You have it by virtue of disfranchising former white Confederates and enfranchising the former slaves. And in the veto message, here's what he says. On the propriety of attempting to make the freemen electors by the proclamation of the executive, I took from my counsel the Constitution. In other words, he is on originalism. In order to deny the blacks the right to vote, I took from my counsel the Constitution. He said, by its authors and their contemporaries, 
when at the first movement toward independence, the Congress of the United States instructed the several states to institute government stone, then that each state decide for itself. Then he's arguing states' rights. So the first argument of states' rights and originalism was made by Andrew Johnson in 1865, and the Congress heard those arguments and overturned his arguments by majority in the state. So how are those arguments valid today when the Constitution of the 14th, 15th Amendment was adopted over those arguments then? Because we are ignorant of and we refuse to even acknowledge the history that is at that time. Next slide, please. Reconstruction required passage of civil and political legislative acts in behalf of freemen by a veto proof Congress to redress the racist legacy of the Constitution's original federal race of representation, the slave power of free from The union could only be restored by amendments to the Constitution secured by the votes of freemen along with the significant disfranchisement of their former enslavers. That is the history. That is the reality. This is not my point of view. This is not my interpretation. This is not my perspective. I'm talking about right or wrong, truth or lies, like right conviction reality over middle. As you recall, next slide, please. This construction outweighed the 14th Amendment. Next slide, please. Daddy Stevens was the father of I want you to say, look at the first draft of the 14th Amendment. What finally, there's a part of the 14th Amendment. I want you to go back and Google for look up the 14th Amendment. Don't read the first section. Read the text clause. The most valuable part of the 14th Amendment is the second section that nobody talks about. You know what the second section is? It is the section that overturned the three fifth laws. No lawyer today will litigate under the second section. You know what the second section say? That if you deny a citizen of your state the right to vote, you lose representation in Congress and proportion to those that you disfranchise. That is in the Constitution, never been enforced, and it's not even enforced today. And the NAACP, the ACLU, is not even deal with it themselves because they know that it will expose and embarrass the judicial system as participating that they know they won't enforce them so they pretend like it don't exist. Go and read the second section of the 14th Amendment. He is the first iteration of it. Stephen and John Commission, the day of the 31st, 1866. Article, representatives shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed, provided that whenever the elected franchise shall be denied or bridge in any state on account of race or color, all persons thereof are such race or color shall be excluded from the basis of representation. So what they say is, you can't count your slaves, your Negroes, and say this is how many representatives we are entitled to in the state, and you don't allow them to vote. You say, well, if you do that, you can only have representatives based on those you allow to vote, and you can't use blacks in the count. That means what? You lose representation. How does that apply today? If you buy, if you are a party and you have a bias system where you are, in essence, you don't count, you can count all of your population, but they're not represented in your representatives, then you have to reduce your representatives based on those who are not counted. That works also in the House of Representatives. You can see why lawyers don't want to touch this, because it's serious. It is serious. Next slide. So, and he is the, the sole argument for everything that he did. The argument that he made 
as to why they have to disfranchise all of those who were in value to the union and, and only now those who vote who was loyal to the union. Sir, our fathers made the Declaration of Independence, and that is what they intended to be the foundation of our government. If they had been able to base their constitution on the principles of the Declaration, they would have been no minute during all time. For every human being would have had his rights. Every human being would have been equal before the law. And no oppression would have been affected except through usurpation against the principles of that government. But it so happened when our fathers came to reduce the principles on which they founded this government into order and shaping the organic law and institution hot from hell appeared among them, which was then increasing in volume and guilt ever since. It affected all of their movements and all their actions and recruited them from carrying out their own principles into the organic law of this union. But rather than not have how many among those 13 colonies they postponed and compromised. They compromised their principles for what they deemed to be a greater good, believing in a short time of work cure and purify the institution which they admitted to be called by it. Next slide. And in essence, what they're saying, he goes on arguing of how this original sin has put us in the position to have the and how our only way to save our soul is to actually, as Lincoln did, make it whole. Now, I'm going to have to wrap up the slide to get you to the end. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. On May 8th, what he's saying here, I can hardly believe it. He's talking about the second section. Any person can be found that will not admit every one of these provisions of the 14th Amendment is just. They are all asserted in some form or other on the Declaration of Organic Law. The second section, not the first section, the author of the Fugitive Amendment said that the second section I consider the most important in the article. If this is the basis of representation in Congress, if any state shall exclude any of her adult male citizens from the effective franchise or bridge that right, she shall for effect her right to representation in the same proportion. The fact of this provision will be evil to compel the states to grant universal suffrage or so sheer them of their power as to keep them forever in hopeless minority in the national government, both in the legislative and executive. Like it. And so what I'd like to say to you here, say to you here, is that what it all led to is they had to disfranchise the former Confederate. They had to enfranchise the former slaves. Three years before there is a 15th Amendment, they passed the Military Reconstruction Act. They put the states under, constant, under uh, military, divided the states into military set and put them under military occupation. Virginia, in the first presidential election in 1868, the party that was up against Ulysses Grant was called, ran on a platform called This is a White Man's Government. You know, the coalition that made up that party, the Democratic Party at that time, was agreed white workers, white supremacists, made by David David Forrest, and a white capitalist from New York. That was the coalition that ran on a platform that this is a white man's government, Mega One, in 1868. And it ran on a platform that if we win, we are going to overturn these reconstruction articles. In other words, make America great again as it was before reconstruction. That was the first, maybe, was in 1860, this is the first presidential election. And Grant ran at that time, under the Military Reconstruction Act, blacks were registered. The largest number of blacks that have ever been registered to vote was in 1868. The largest number of blacks to ever vote in a presidential election were as slaves. 
He voted in higher numbers than blacks had ever voted for a president since slavery. Most slaves voted before the over 50th Amendment for the first president's election than we who voted for Obama. 78% of them turned out. Only 58% of us turned out. And the other thing that is valued to learn from that is that Ulysses Grant, the president that made the Union to victory, and the first presidential election following the Civil War, lost the majority of the white vote to the candidate that ran on this is a white man's government, you be all worried. Grant won because as slaves were allowed to vote for the first time. There were 12% of the voting population, and they voted overwhelmingly for Grant. So the first president to be elected that did not represent the majority white choice, but represented the majority choice, that represented the majority black choice, which is Mrs. Grant. And the other thing is, when he promised that if he win, that the first thing that his administration would do would be to pass the 15th Amendment. And when he did, he said, this is the greatest thing that ever happened since the commencement of this country. And it was, let me leave you with this last word, it was not bipartisan. The number of votes for the party that ran with a coalition of agreed white workers, white racists, and the New York capitalists, they cast zero votes in Congress for the 14th Amendment. There was zero votes for the 15th Amendment. And there was only a quarter of them voted for the 13th Amendment. So the 14th and 15th Amendment is not a part of your Constitution as a basis of bipartisanship. It was part of your Constitution because of a veto-proof Congress that checkmated the uh, Supreme Court and checkmated the Chief Executive. The reason why you have the United States of America today is because of a partisan party that had a veto-proof Congress in the black vote. We look back to the past and illuminate the present so that we can have a full insight into the future. And history's telling is not enough that we expose what has been ignored. We have to confront what is being denied. Only then will history fulfill a promise for us as a nation and as a people. Day Monday when people thank our armed forces both past and present. Two central Virginia organizations are making sure the contributions of African American men and women in uniform are remembered. NBC 29 CJ Pascal is in downtown Charlottesville with the details on what's happening at the Jefferson School. Hi CJ. Hey Sharon. The military history of African Americans in this country goes back more than a, a century before the abolition of slavery and that's right before our nation was even founded. We want to educate people as to that we all participated in this great society to make it free. 
not just a couple of guys, but everybody. More than 27 exhibitors represent the African American military experience from the Revolutionary War up to the present day. Many of the exhibits are manned by veterans talking about their own personal experiences. They call this the Forgotten War. So any any uh, opportunity I have to remind folks that it was a war, and then when I think about the result of having had that war, how the South Koreans are, are really progressing, they've done so well. The Jefferson School event is meant to provide an educational opportunity, especially for students. Our mission is to educate people about the historically segregated fighting units of the United States military as well as the experiences of present-day uh, veterans. We found it to be necessary because the average person is not aware that the military was segregated. We hope that they realize that when they see documentation and see films and see pictures that you know there might be uh, my great-grandfather, that might be my great-grandmother, you know, it, that participated in this particular thing. While the event is meant to educate both the next generation and the public, the veterans say it's special to them, too. If you were a soldier, it, it is just uh, uh, really unbelievable. It's honorable to have this. It means a lot because you be uh, among other uh, veterans and it brings back memories about your years in service and we get to change the information and, and get to uh, know people a little bit more. And if you didn't get a chance to make it out to the event today, it continues tomorrow at the Jefferson School from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Live downtown in Charlottesville, C.J. Pascal, NBC 29 News.